Hello, everyone. It's uh, really good to see people coming back to the meetups, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. And uh, hopefully, we'll continue on this trend and see more, more and more coming back in, in the future. In the meanwhile, I'm. Uh, um, yeah, I, my name is Olga, and I work in NZX, which is a, a division inside ANZ where we build new digital bank, which is ANZ Plus. It's been on the market for about a year now, and uh, very exciting time in the pro in the like in the project. And today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, how the challenges of uh, how you cost optimize your Kubernetes infrastructure in particular. Why would you want, for example, to go to something like sport instances? How, how many troubles you're going to bring on your head and how you're going to solve it? And particularly how SRE can help us navigate all of these uh, uh, troubles. So, yeah, so what we're going to talk about actually, the important thing that what I'm not going to talk about is actually the right sizing of the workloads, because this is the topic that is a huge topic on its own. If we start on this, we'll be here until Christmas and we will never end this topic. It is very difficult to get it right and it is even more difficult to maintain it over a long period of time. What we will assume for today is that in the end of the day, you have compute that you need to pay for. And we will look at into some of the options how you can utilize uh, reserved instances or saving plans or things like that and how why it is actually not enough if you want to to go more aggressive on on savings and if your environment allows for some of instabilities then you can go and explore spot instances like we did for non-production clusters okay so what do we have uh, in terms of uh, uh, savings options when when it comes to to compute capacity so we have uh, i want to read all of this but the the main the main point here is that the more commitment you can, the longer the commitment you can commit to and uh, the less flexible you, your situation that you put yourself in, for example, you commit for specific instance, you commit for a specific time frame, and then you'll get the more discounts. And uh, there is two different types. One is resource-based and one is spend-based. So the resource-based is that you say, I will be using this specific instance for this time, or you can say, I will spend that, ma that many dollars on compute capacity, and you have the flexibility of what, uh, what, what instances you're going to, to be using. And depending on this, the, the amount of savings that you get are, are different. They're, they could be quite a good discounts, like the, getting to 72% of on-demand prices is quite significant savings. But the challenge with that is that like during the week, maybe your traffic or during the month, your traffic may look something like that. You'll, you'll have like baseline is that, but uh, your peak time is uh, higher. And over three years, you'll be growing, hopefully, and your baseline is also changing. So it's very difficult to combine all of these reserved instances or committed user discounts in a way that cover as, as much as possible of your compute, but don't overspend on, 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 on these plans. Because whatever you committed and you're paying for, but you are not using it, you are not going to get this money back. So to address this, uh, this challenge, what you can do in addition to this, or maybe instead of this, it depends on your reliability targets and the budget targets, Another approach is to use the spot instances. Now, spot instances is something that every major cloud offers. It is instances that are provisioned out of uh, spare capacity of the data center, and they come with very significant discounts compared to what we saw on the uh, compared to on demand. So this line, the discount is the advertised savings by the by these cloud providers compared to on demand. The catch here, of course, is that these instances don't have any availability guarantees. They have zero SLA on availability. They, they can be available, they can be unavailable. You, can, you may be able to provision a certain amount of them, but at any minute you can lose them. And uh, 
when the preemption happens, you have only um, in GCP, you'll have 30 seconds to return the instance and there is nothing you can do about this. And uh, this is, as you can imagine, really challenging, but it's not impossible to run um, to run your workloads, your Kubernetes pretty reliably, even, even with these uh, constraints. So there is a few major challenges that uh, you should should be solving before going into into spot, and the first and foremost is actually spot capacity management, because you have to have the automatic fallback to on demand, because otherwise you can end up in a situation that you just don't have any capacity. It's outside of your control. You don't know when and how many of these instances will be available. You don't know how when will they be taken away, and so forth. So there is. The, the approach that you would want to, to use here, or at least one of the accepted patterns is that you'll mix spot and on-demand node pools, and then the cluster out of scalers that manage these node pools, there's, very, there's a lot of flavors of cluster out of scalers. They will choose based on your constraints and requirements, which node pool to scale up. For example, cluster out of scale is the um, like is the main uh, open source GitHub uh, out of scale. It has a few expanders, and one of them is called priority based expander. So it's uh, like a name suggests. You just uh, specify what are your priorities for which node pool to to expand next. So in this config map here, you can see uh, it says uh, with this priority. Provision spot instances. If that fails, then go and provision on demand. Um, in GK, the out of scaler that comes with GK, for example, it uses another expander, which is uh, price optimized by default. So if you have few node pools that match the pending post requirement, it will choose the, the cheapest one. And then for your workloads, you have to have something that tells that tells Kubernetes that these ports, they can go on support, but if that's not available, they can also go to on demand. And this is managed with weighted node, node affinities. So this is quite complex, but this is possible. And, uh, and um, there is other ways that you can um, reserve capacity. For example, it's kind of counterintuitive because um, you're running on support and you're running, you want to save money, but still you want to have at least, at least some headroom. So cluster auto scalers, again, they, they can provide you this uh, configurability where they tell you, I will not try to pack all my nodes to 99%. I will leave some room. If this is not enough or if it's not work or, or you need more, there is also approach to deploy like uh, dummy pods, dummy deployments that run on very low priority. And they will be like your, uh, like the balloon pods that you pop when you need uh, your real workloads to run on the clusters. And in meanwhile, they will be pending pods to, to provision more capacity for um, like to reserve more nodes. And then there is also, of course, a lot of commercial solutions like to every problem there is uh, someone who already solved and uh, wants to make money out of it. This, this is something that I worked before in some previous, in my previous job, this is spot by NetApp. What they offer is managed data plane for Kubernetes. They completely take the management of um, compute for you and they deploy uh, machine learning and predictive algorithms to predict when preemptions will happen and they proactively replace VMs. And this is quite amazing because by doing this, they, they can provide enterprise SLA even when running on spot infrastructure. So the next one um, I'll talk briefly is the, uh, the applications that run on spot instances. Any application that runs on Kubernetes needs to be ready to be preempted. Spot or not spot, it, uh, like scale downs uh, happen, node auto repairs happen, things happen all the time in Kubernetes, it's dynamic environment. And um, all these things here, they sh you should be doing them on default anyways, but they are really crucial on, on spot instances. So first of all, 
the applications that can run on Spot are stateless applications or interactive web service. Um, this application should implement a handle on sick term. This is how the operating system lets the process know that the process soon will be shut down. When that happens, the application should stop accepting any new work and uh, finish whatever it has right now, finish in-flight requests, close the outside connections, and whatever may be specific for your app. Um, and this is implemented by not graceful shutdown, which is available in upstream Kubernetes. So one of the things that uh, Kubernetes is uh, doing for you, it, it manages this uh, propagation of sick terms. It's, uh, man it marks the node as not ready so that the new pods don't get there. And uh, a lot of things around the node shut down. So, okay, so we've done all this homework. Everything is uh, good. Our application can gracefully shut down, the cluster can fall back, but still compared to completely on-demand cluster, you, you will have a lot more movement in the cluster because there will be preemptions to your VMs that otherwise don't happen in the real cluster. And they're also different in the nature because for example, scaling down is graceful operation. It also scales Gradually, it scales nodes that are not used, not utilized. But what can happen here is that a, a lot of pods hosting a lot of nodes can be preempted all at once. And all of these new processes, they will want to start somewhere else all at once. And so it, in the beginning, this is what we started to see a lot happening in spot clusters, is that we started to see a lot of pods in very confusing states. We started to see things like uh, a lot of out of CPU on the pod, which was, uh, it's really not an issue at the moment when you look at this, but it really does confuse your, cust your customers of your platform, like the value streams and people who are not technical, like, oh, we're running on sport and now we are, what happens, we completely, don't have any CPU left in the cluster. This is, by the way, hap can happen in the um, on-demand cluster as well. It's just the amounts that it is now so much more visible to people who work with your platform. Then there are things like completed for something like ingress gateway or any deployment. Doesn't make sense for any deployment to be completed. And then things like node affinities and then a lot, a lot more that uh, that in the end of the day, they are not an issues, but they do create the issue by creating all this noise around uh, your, especially platform consumers, because it makes, uh, it makes this, it makes look like there are really a lot of issues that you don't understand that there is a pod stacks in the um, not ready or pod stuck in error or where's my, why is this pod is not, not affinity? Why my deployment is not coming up? And some of them are indeed really confusing because for example, if, if we look at pod not affinities, you'll see something that it looks like really stuck because this is this particular event, it says, I can't, I can't load this config map and config map does exist in the cluster and it has the fresh time, time stamp, so it shows like I'm still working on this node, just a little bit more, and maybe this pod will be running. And uh, things like uh, that are outside of platform or any software engineering concerns. This is the like root CA. Why would it not be able to to mount it in the pod? And again, with the, with the fresh timestamp. So, but especially these ones, they were always blamed for something that if my deployment doesn't work. It timed out waiting for some uh, for something to come up. They will go and look in, in their terminals. They will look at this pod and they just just I wait a little bit more and this pod will come up. Why is this pod is not coming up? But this is a wrong direction to look for a solution for their problems because this is not the root cause for why their deployment timed out. And this is because 
all of these statuses that I showed you before, they all, when you look into them, you'll see that it is phase failed. And this is terminal status. And that means that deployment or repl like replica set or the stateful set or whatever the, the high level controller, it will detect this terminal state and it will create the replacement replicas immediately. And now that's why, now this is the quotas from public support case. It's a reply, it's a, it was handled by Google engineers and this is what they say, because of this, this is failed. This is, has little to no impact on workloads, but apart from all this confusion that they create, they actually can create some impact because again, because you, you can have a large amount of pods that are fighting for the new nodes and, uh, and then most of these error statuses will occur. So now, yeah, so as I said before, we should be building platform that is reliable, that is easy, and that is uh, like, if we want to save the money on compute, we also want to not lose the money on wasted cycles for, for people. And we also need to understand that people who work on our clusters, like software engineers, they're not expected to be ex experts in Kubernetes or, or in something like all these dead pods. They want platform <laughs> To, de to deliver features, the business features. Okay, so it is our job, platform and SRE, to make the platform stable, easy to work with, and, um, and uh, available. So as I said, again, I'm, I, I don't want to repeat too much, or, uh, too much on this. So this, uh, raising all these issues, uh, trying to, to clear out all this confusion, it does waste people's cycles. So we, we wanted to solve all these like technically not issues. So specifically uh, about, uh, about the noise pods, I'll talk about it a, a bit later. But what is important here is, and I think it's very crucial, is that to have, uh, to have this critical user journeys and there's a loss on your platform, and why is it important is for, for two reasons. So first, it is your agreement between you and between your platform con consumers. And you'll say, I'll provide this level of reliability. And if I don't, I don't know, we'll do something else. We'll, we'll manually scale on demand. We'll do something that if we burn the agreed rate, the error rate, we will, we will keep an eye on this and we will stand in our agreement. And this gives the, the confidence for, for our consumers that the platform performs the way it's supposed to be performing. And uh, if we have issues, then maybe it's not always spot instances to, to blame for, maybe it's something else. And this is where also monitoring is important. So we have dashboards that, sh that show when preemptions are happening in which zone, in which cluster, in which uh, project. I think there is no point to alert on preemptions because there is nothing, you, you can't improve on it, right? It's, it's outside of your control. Preemptions just happen and this is a way of life on Kubernetes on, on spot. But what it does help is that uh, you can always let your developers know. So here, at this time, there was no preemption. So whatever issue you're having with your pipeline is probably something else or the other way around. So at this time we had massive preemptions. So it's very likely that the issues that you're facing is because of this. And for alerting, alerting is also like related to uh, critical user journeys and SLOs. And I think the most important measure here is the actually pending pods, because this is what happens when preemption happens, the replacement pods created, and this is how you want to measure how long and how many of the of these pods are waiting. Maybe you need more headroom, maybe you need more on demand, or maybe you need to um, change something else in your out of scale profile. Okay, so about the noise pods, so we want to take this out of the out of the equation completely. We don't want to explain them again and again. This is not an issue. We just don't want to see it 
to have this in front of their eyes. There is um, this project on Kubernetes uh, 6, which is called the scheduler, which is useful not only in sport instances, but specifically in sport instances, it helps with the rebalancing availability zones because uh, availability zones unbalanced in sport way more than it is on demand because your cloud provider will choose the zone where the preemptions are less likely. And you also have, obviously have much more movement. So over time, you will end up with the different zones and different uh, loads on different zones. And uh, the scheduler may help with this. The schedule also help with this. It has different policies based on which it evicts pods from the nodes. Another one is spread pods across uh, from the same node to, to as many nodes as possible. And uh, another one is removes this uh, failed pods immediately. So it makes the cluster look much cleaner and easier to work with. And uh, now the way I sometimes talk about the sport instances in our clusters is take it as a free cast engineering. It is uh, sometimes extreme chaos engineering, but it it surfaces so many issues that are not always the platform issues that are either misconfiguration on the workload or best practices that are missing. So many things that we fix to, due to this actually making our product even now production workloads so stronger because we pay now attention to all of this good practices and uh, um, like all the things that you will see here, replication, you so obviously everything should be replicated, spread across nod, uh, zones and nodes with uh, topology spread constraints, pod affinities, anti-affinities, graceful shutdown, probes, and especially the startup probes, because obviously you'll have way more startups happening in your cluster than compared to completely on, on demand tier applications by priority so that um, your most important application will get the chance to run first and the like less important application will wait for cluster to scale up and the uh, port disruption budgets like, they will not protect from spot preemption because when cloud requests these instances back there is no other way you, you just have to give the uh, you ha just have to give the instance back but overall while it won't protect on the uh, ports on the preempted instance. It can still protect other parts of applications that are still running from other types of uh, disruptions. So yeah, and I think um, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. As I said, this uh, highlighted a few um, few challenges for us, and uh, it's um, makes like. What doesn't kill you make you stronger, basically. So what we implemented also in the non-production, it it will also say like, do we also want this to be in production? Do we do we also want to uh, implement all these be best practices, bake, bake them into the pipelines, and uh, have all this um, all these uh, things working? Yep, that's uh, all I have for today. Thank you. That was a great talk. Um, it's almost like chaos engineering in a way. Yeah, that's a, chaos engineering. Yeah, this is what I used to say. Like it's uh, the chaos engineering is in the terms that you want to find out your weak points before you go to production. Yeah. And was this all in GCP or were you using yeah, so, all three of the clouds? No. So the the other clouds that I uh, talked about, or rather, I put them on the slides just for the comparison. That's um, not really what what is used, but we primarily run on GCP. Yeah. Yeah, I spent, I spent a lot of time grappling with what is since floats in AWS and things. And like, yeah. So <laughs> this is the so with AWS, I also had my my previous job was with a like I worked with AWS and we ran Kubernetes clusters, which are DIY clusters actually <laughs> at the time when you bid for the prices and we use this as put by NetApp, which was awesome. 
And I find that the AWS uh, way how they price and change the pricing for spot instances is more uh, complex. The price changes very frequently. You can bid, you can set marks, you can do a lot of, you can choose the flavor if you want price optimized, capacity optimized, price capacity optimized. Whereas with Google, they just set one number once a month and this is all what you have. So in a way, it makes it much more easier to do it on Google. Yeah, another thing I was wondering was, um, how did you actually go around, go about setting SLOs with your users? So like, what's an SLO that you set and how did you actually come to that agreement or did you come to it internally? Yeah, so we use a platform, uh, so we, yeah, we use a certain platform for all the SLOs and uh, so the interface is very familiar to everyone who is, uh, no matter if you work on platform or if you work or if you're software engineer, you have the same kind of interface. So you have your SLOs, you have your error burn rate, and uh, you'll have like how much budget is left, right? So it's, it's exactly the same, exactly the same thing. So no, our goal is to host everything that is on the, uh, that is deployed to the cluster, right? If you, if you deployed something, we assume that you want it running. So every time that we have pending pod, SLO is actually burning. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a little bit longer than that. So the the lifespan of the instances, it's uh, it's all you know. Your mileage may vary because they have literally zero availability guarantee. But from the experience, it it, it is very different. Sometimes these nodes are running for weeks. Sometimes they are. Sometimes we have these uh, preemptions happening, but it can be reclaimed sort of immediately. It, it will be different PM, but it is reclaimed. And from Kubernetes perspective, it looks like exactly the same node. Okay. We talked about um, you know, SLOs and the uh, the number of pods that are pending at any time. Do you track that across the entire cluster or by deployment or by tenant? Across the entire cluster. Okay. So if you have one bad tenant who keeps deploying for uh, <laughs> deployments that always seem pending for excessive periods of time. So again, the, the goal is to accommodate everything, regardless of what their priority or like, you, you know, on deployment on the pod, you can set the priority of this deployment so that the high priority pods can kick out the low priority pods. So this is up to them to manage how they want to, to tier their applications. So if they want to, like my application is the most important in the world, they will put their, their highest priority that is allocated to software engineers. And um, yeah, it will kick out less, less important ports. But from our perspective, these are pending ports and we need to provide the capacity for them to run So this is open source and this is Kubernetes SIG and uh, definitely it's not only for non-production or for spot instances, it's very useful for uh, even completely on-demand cluster because in on-demand you can also get to the, um, to the state where your deployments are unbalanced across the zones. You, you can definitely get to the state where you have few pods on the same node or uh, all these things that, that are definitely relevant on, on on-demand. And I think everything that I talked about is relevant for 
100% on-demand notebooks uh, clusters because it is dynamic environment. Pods can nodes can go down, can come up. There is a restarts on the node that can happen outside of your control. There is node rotations. There is cluster upgrades. So your application is going up and down all the time. It's just that on spot it happens a little bit more and with a little bit different um, char characteristics that when it sometimes it can happen in huge amounts. So how you handle that? But you still have to handle the pre, uh, like the port termination, the port startup, and all these things uh, are important for on demand as well. And this is what I think it uh, gives us these learnings, and then we can apply them as well to production and to non-production as well as. So like when uh, when when you are handling the when you are scaling up, so for the scaling up on the nodes is also dependent on spot instance as well, or do you go to the area of using uh, on demand uh, for nodes as well? Or is it so the so you can um, so this is uh, covered here. There is different ways how this is handled. Our priority is to always do spot if that's available. And if it's not available, then it will fall back to on demand. There is more solutions than, than what uh, I listed here. For example, AWS have open source uh, cluster autoscaler called uh, Carpenter that handles a lot of, that it has a lot of very rich features and, uh, and especially for designated features for spot. But even the basic one, this is the, the config map here of the priority based expander for cluster out of scalar. This is the default cluster out of scalar from the Kubernetes open source project. So you, you configure the priorities for how you want to scale up. Depending how many node pools you have in your cluster and depending pod, it can, it can be applicable, it can be scheduled on a few node pools, so it can be scheduled on only one. Uh, I, I laughed when I saw the, uh, the error for the CA thing because that, that's uh, hit me so many times and like had somebody call me up and said, oh, that's a regression and you do have a charge. <laughs> and it's like, no, actually, it's just like you run out of capacity. <laughs> First, the first couple of times that saw me, I spent ages digging into why why this could, could happen, and yeah, then I learned this that it's some kind of scaling problem on the cluster. Yeah, so this out of CPU? Oh, the, the CIE error. Uh, I. It's a one. Uh, I. <laughs> because it's just such an obtuse sort of error, uh, but yeah, it's just. It's it is incredibly confusing. And, uh, you only understand it's it may seem trivial when it is on the slide but actually no one really wants to go and dig into this port and understand why why is this happening yeah just just delete them <laughs> If you don't have the schedule, you can just delete them with one line of bash, like kubectl get pods by this status and uh, remove them. Because it, like, it is a real issue and it does catch people and uh, like out of CPU, <laughs> you know. Um, in spite of uh, someone's spite, when the pods are in all kinds of weird space, the PSIs kind of try and you mean how how often we clean these ones? Yeah. So the thing is that they don't cause any trouble. Yeah. They, so they are not uh, they are not in, they are completely invisible to any SLOs, to any alerting because they are dead pods. They are just sitting there, right? And this is part of the part of this journey is because. We switched to, to this model and everything looks fine for us. But at this, at this time, who, the people who look most at the ports are actually the, the platform customers. So the software engineers, 
and they were presented with this problem. So they look at this and say, what is going on here? So would we adjust the SLO slightly? Or like no, the, the, there, is no, there is no SLO that uh, effect <laughs> because you, you can have 20 out of CPU ports, but as long as you have this uh, two out of two in this example, as long as you have X out of X ports rep, uh, running and ready, it's not, it's not an issue. You can have 20 of them, you can have 1,000 of them, they're just not doing anything. They, they're just objects in etcd, that's it. They don't take capacity on your cluster, they, they don't run, they don't cause, don't accept any traffic. As long as the devs don't do the thing. Huh? Can I miss or something? <laughs> <laughs> what percentage of cost reduction for the Ah, so the actual dollar figure, I of course can't uh, tell you, <laughs> but uh, so what Google advertises is 60 to 99% of on demand and uh, other clouds are similar, kind of similar numbers. But what is difficult with Google is actually to know exact amount, exact discount at this kind of month or, or month before. There is a way how to do it, but it's not very intuitive. With AWS, for example, you can use, describe spot price, filter when, what instance, what region, and you'll get the number. This is a very powerful. And also with spot instance advice, the webpage, they will also show you what's the current rate preemption. And, um, yeah, but uh, to tell you the number, I can't, I can't really tell you the, the number. And there is a, you can, you also need to adjust that uh, during this time, everything is gross, like the, the number of features or the number of uh, the infrastructure that we require. But it is really worth it. Worth it. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. I'm just going to check that online just in case they... Yeah. Awesome, we've missed it. No, no questions at the moment, I don't think. Oh, good, you must have covered it all, Olga. Um, <laughs> any more from the floor? Oh, well, thank you all for coming, and more importantly, thank you for for presenting Olga, it's, it's brilliant to hear. It's, I was actually, I, don't, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I work for Iterate and I do tech recruitment. And a couple of months ago, I was actually recruiting for, for a company that wanted someone who specialized in capacity management. So um, I guess my question to you around that is like, should, I tend to find that it doesn't necessarily sit with engineers around capacity management and the new term FinOps has come FinOps, in. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think it should sit with engineers in terms of you know capacity and the cost? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a manager. I'm an engineer, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think that it is uh, it, it is touching on few teams. Yeah. Right. It, and you require different uh, type of engineering capacity as well, and as uh, like forecast the budget and uh, all these things, and uh, you also need to manage like. How much you want to spend on the platform, or okay. how how reliable you want your platform, or what features are important to develop. Okay. But engineering, for example, if they say here's the target you want you want to make your platform under this uh, under this certain level, yeah, right? Then you will need to engineer to say we can't do this, or we can do this or we can do this, but we'll have to do sport completely, for example, and then our customers prepared to deal with this. And yeah. by customers, I mean the platform customers. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thank you again for presenting. Um, I'll hopefully do another one soon. <laughs> and thanks to the guys at Cognizant Servian for assisting me with organizing this. It's been a journey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we've got an online event for the next one on the 2nd of August, which I can't remember what it's about, but I will be able to tell you. Um, 
it is about addressing app performance issues and enhancing CSAT and ops efficiency. That will just be purely online. Uh, it'll be me and one of the co-hosts who run the Sydney SRE meetup doing it. And then we should be probably doing the next in-person one, um, probably looking at September, October time, um, probably at Vanguard. So it'd be good to all see you there. I know Vanguard have had a bit of a journey around SRE, but like coming from the States and kind of putting it into the Melbourne office has, has probably proved some challenges, but thank you all for coming again. Um, in terms of other things, like you'll get sent a, um, like a form after this, if you've registered obviously on the meetup, we love feedback. Obviously we, we do it not only, well, we do it obviously for you guys to network and kind of meet each other. And we always would love to hear your stories as well. So if you've got any interesting stories around SRE, platform engineering, I'd say Kubernetes, but I think there's about four Kubernetes meetups in, in mm -hmm. Melbourne at the moment. Um, then please like hit me up and I'd, I'd love to obviously host you and kind of yeah, listen to your story. But a big hand to Olga and the guys at Cognitive Serving Guys. <laughs> and enjoy what is left of the, the pizza and, and or beer and feel free to network.